and explain the design process. Thanks, uh, th thanks, thanks, Sandy. The, um, uh, I'm not going to go through the Bensock um, bond because um, uh, I think it, I think I've spoken at you know easily half a dozen presentations and we've sort of it's it's out there. Um, if you still are not aware of it, um, there'll be um, a summary on westpac.com.au um, on my team's um, you know internet site um, over the next sort of couple of weeks. So. Um, so I'm not going to go into sort of the detail of that transaction. It was really um, to look at sort of how or what, what our thinking was in regard to sort of pulling a transaction of this style together. Um, and I think that when, um, when we first saw the, um, the Centre for Social Impact's um, original study, we thought it was a great idea to, to be a part of the, you know, the, or the establishment of a social finance market. Um, the, 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 the characteristics of it was essentially, you know, in, in um, sort of banking parlance, a structured finance type of issue. Um, and uh, for my sins, I'm responsible for structured finance at, um, at, at Westpac. So uh, therefore, uh, you know, I felt it was something that we needed to, um, to pursue. Um, so, you know, I, I think that from an organisation perspective, there is an, there's always an aspiration to give things a crack. And I thought that, you um, you know, we certainly did this um, in, in this particular case. I think the other issue is, is that um, our aspiration, and I've seen some of Trevor's notes, um, and so there is, you may see a bit of, um, you know, perhaps disagreement or, or, you know, I mean, it probably isn't, but, um, uh, you know, at, at the margin, but um, our aspiration is to try and facilitate a deeper um, social finance capital market. Um, we weren't involved in this. We didn't do it on the basis of just having a one-off. You know, I think one-offs, you know, really doesn't build, you know, sort of for, uh, for, for better communities, you know, down the line. The first deals or the first few deals are the hardest, but um, I think that that's, um, you know, what the principles are of our involvement. And so, you know, some of the more technical issues um, that, um, that, that came across everyone's table when this deal was being done was really about trying to establish a foundation for actually a total market rather than looking at the deal we completed as, as, as a one-off. So in, in terms of, so Sandy's asked me to, to speak about what were the things that we were, or uh, well, the considerations that we were thinking about when we um, looked to design the bond. And I, and I think that, and I'm sure everyone in this room is aware that the government uh, you know, did a tender and it awarded um, uh, well, three organisations, there were three sponsors. Um, uh, you know, the you know the, well, the New South Wales government sponsored three organisations to launch social benefit bonds. Um, social Ventures did the first, we did the second, and then Social Ventures, I think, is doing the last. So, um, and so I think that that was sort of the genesis of it all. Um, when we came to look at it more pragmatically, and I think it goes to the heart of the questions today, is is that you know we. Um, one of the things that really was appealing to us was, in fact, the purpose of, of assisting, um, you know, the out of, you know, improving out of home care services, or at least reducing the incidence of it. Um, and so, um, so therein lies, from my perspective, the first principle is is that what is the need? Um, is the need? Actually, I do have notes here, but Sandy said I wasn't allowed to show them on the board. So, if um, anyone's desperate for my notes, I'm happy to send them to you. But, I mean, Sandy can give you my details. Um, and so, you know, the, I, I think that from certainly my perspective, um, sort of the key overwhelming issue is is that what is the need? Um, when in the in the project that um, we've all been experiencing, the New South Wales. Um, you know, government, you know, identified the need, you know, it was compelling to all individuals and when we actually sold the bond in the end, it was in fact um, quite a compelling issue from the perspective of, um, from the investors as well. So whilst we had benevolent institutions at one end with the big ticket investments, the million dollar plus investments, you know, there are a lot of, you know, smaller individuals, well, I mean, I'd have to say that the minimum investment was fifty thousand dollars, but you know, um, you know, individuals with fifty thousand dollars or more who actually had a, a bias towards, um, uh, you know, family welfare in, in New South Wales. Um, I think that. Um, uh, so w when you think about that need, I'd, I'd recommend that people think about when you're c trying to construct our project um, or, or the or the actual bond. Um, it's appropriate to think about what is 
you know, what is being financed, you know, is it an existing program or it is, a, is it actually a planned project? Um, uh, the new PIN project um, or the new PIN bond was in fact a, an already established program um, and um, uh, whereas the project that we had through the Benevolent Society wasn't a, an existing program, in fact that's a, a program that needs to be sort of built up. Um, I think we chose the tougher one, um, yeah, no, only from the perspective is, is that it's, you know, it's harder from, a, from the get-go to develop um, you know, KPIs, performance hurdles, etc. for a project that otherwise doesn't exist. You don't have that back experience. I mean, you've got anecdotal experience, but you don't actually have the back experience of the program to be able to sort of enhance the project going forward. Um, and so, um, you know, our program was a new program um, rather than expansion to an existing program. I think that if you're looking to go down this track, um, I, you know, certainly the easiest approach is to um, adopt the expansion of an existing program or supporting an existing program. Um, I, th I think the second point is, is that who is, and, and you know, that's, there's a few organisations here, but you know, who are the, you know, the issuer, the sponsor, the service providers and the advisors? Um, and um, you know, I'd sort of hasten to add that you know, in, in, in this market, um, there is no great honeypot of money with investors sort of just, you know, just clamouring to invest money. Um, even the benevolent institutions, foundations and the like, they all have a fiduciary duty to be responsible with how, actually how they, how they invest. So they are going to spend a lot of time understanding the project and it's all of the financials. So if, you're, um, if, you're, if you believe you have a project, if you're not financial, financially literate, in a very detailed way, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that you get there um, quite quickly um, because you know, most investors probably um, would not support your project. Um, I think that you need to, you know, so, so the, the, the next issue is, you know, broadly the service providers. So, you know, an, an organisation typically, you know, is both the sponsor um, as well as service provider, but if, it's, if they're different, um, you know, the service provider needs to think about, you know, those KPIs and whether they, um, you can't, you, you just can't think that if I spend a dollar, that that dollar is going to, you know, give some third party a good experience. That dollar is actually an investment dollar that we're going to need to have KPIs that proves a rate of return somehow. Um, and that's, that's really quite important from a social um, a benefit bond perspective. Um, I've spoken to probably dozens of organisations, uh, typically charities, um, and, and generally I'm sort of finding that, um, uh, you know, they talk about what they do and they receive grant money from the government and when I introduce a conversation about, you know, KPIs, performance, how do you know whether that dollar was a great investment, how do you know that you're, in, you're effective, they'll, they'll, they'll refer to the anecdotes of their experience rather than the data. And um, you know, in the in, in financing, people you know, bankers love data. Investors love data. They want to see that if the dollar goes in, that they've got some sort of reasonable um, chance of actually getting their money back, and with a better luck, some returns. Um, the third point is, what do investors want? Um, and, and whilst we didn't achieve this, um, any of the major points of what investors in Australia want. Um, you know, we, we, you know, I think that's a part of sort of developing this market. But what, what the big investors that we were trying to target in our bond, um, you know, with a view to creating a deeper market, um, investors are looking for large investments. So typically the big fund managers, they're looking for, um, and, and I'm referring to sort of professional institutional fund managers because there are, um, you know, many individuals who are happy to, you know, obviously contribute over time. But I do think that we need to sort of, to, to create a true market here, we need to get um, big institutions involved to a certain percentage of their, of their corpus. Um, so typically those institutions are, um, those organisations, you know, typically have large lines of investment. They're reasonably conservative, they follow um, you know, basically an investment mandate or typically an investment mandate that's been, um, you know, that's been established because of a, um, a, you know, an asset consultant, you know, so you need to change their mind as well as the fund. You know, they're looking for security, they're looking for a, a rating potentially, they're looking for liquidity and the list goes on. 
Um, unfortunately, in our social benefit bond, um, most of those we did not meet, so therefore we obviously had a challenge. Um, that said, I mean, the bond's been sold, so, you know, the, um, the community is going to be $10 million better off, but, um, 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 but, you know, if we're looking to expand that market, people need to consider those issues as we go forward. Um, one of the things that when I was considering this, um, I felt that we, we needed to create, that there's, call it different, different investors and different investor appetites. There are investors that are happy to take um, exposure you know, to the, you know, the potential loss of their capital. Um, and it was our view that you know, benevolent institutions are likely to be that sort of organisation because they can invest their money, but then again, they're doing grants from time to time. Um, so the consequence of a grant is basically um, spent capital, was the theory. And then there are other organised or people and organisations who um, are keen to invest, but they want their um, their capital protected somehow. And that's how we um, uh, decided to develop a capital protected tranche. So there's two tranches in our in our program. 75% of that 10 million dollars um, was capital protected, i.e., worst case scenario. Um, the, the investors get their principal back, um, but there is no guarantee of return, and the other 25% um, was where the capital was exposed to total risk, and obviously the return exposed to total risk. Um, so their worst case scenario was, um, was zero percent, um, it was zero return even of capital. So, um, so moving on further on, the, you know, my fourth point is who are the likely investors? When you're looking at a program, um, you know, it's best to sort of, you know, it's great to have a program, but you need to sort of come to the project with who are the likely investors that are likely to be enamoured towards this particular project. Um, I think that there are, you know, some projects which are, um, are going to be tough in the early stages of development of the market that we're talking, uh, talking about here. So, um, and, and particularly those investors that are going to have their capital at risk um, get them in early and, 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 and get them to enjoy the experience. And, and in fact, that's what we did with, um, is Susan here? Um, um, anyway, the, the, with the Westpac Foundation and the St George Foundation, um, we were speaking to them quite early because we pretty, pretty much pivoted, pivoted the whole deal off their um, million dollar, in, well, it's actually $1.2 million investment. Um, and then it's, it's about sort of thinking about, so, you know, my, my you know, I would emphasise that you need to, you know, it's great to have a project and it's great to have a need, but, but, you know, whoever's running that project needs to have a good understanding of the likely investors. And Sandy, I know I'm, I'm out of time. Um, so, um, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, other, I've got a range of sort of issues here, but um, I'll just rattle through them. Um, you know, managing the bond end to end is, is, is the headline I put on it, on it but um, the first point is select your partners carefully. Um, if government's involved, get, get engaged with them early and actively um, and get them to um, get agreement on project terms as soon as possible without getting a million people around the table because that will slow up the process. All your partners need um, great great organisational endorsement all the way through the organisation. It's great to have the chief executive engaged, but if, it's, but if the, the most junior person on the project is not engaged and is only there um, you know, because the boss told them to be there, um, you're going to have a disaster. Um, engage with the cornerstone investors, which I've mentioned. Clear timetable. Um, our project went for about two years, um, and I reckon that was about you know, sort of one and a half years too long. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, Trevor might comment on that. Um, the, um, you know, think about the contractual requirements. Um, you know, we think um, more is, is better, um, uh, but that's not everyone's view. Um, uh, and, and just get on with it. Um, the, the last point was, um, um, we, we, we liked, our, our project involved classic structured finance project, um, 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 you know, structures, the use of a, you know, a, a third party trust, um, which is managed by a professional trustee, perpetuals, you know, we, we felt that that was good from a protection of all the parties from unintended consequences, you know, that's probably not going to happen here, but again, it's about sort of coming up with a, um, a, a, a bond design that is sort of sound, 
um, going down the line. So, and, and as a consequence, what we'd like people to do is to try and replicate what we've been trying, that we've what we've built. Um, albeit, um, you know, some might prefer to have something a little bit simpler. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, you know, I, I think they're pretty much all the issues I just wanted to cover off right now. And I think the rest will probably come out through the discussion. government's really pleased with the outcome of the bond issue. Uh, two years passes quickly when you're having fun with friends, <laughs> perhaps. Um, let me make some comments. I'm not representing government, but let me make some comments, though, from government's perspective. Um, if you read some of the writings of people like Gary Sturgis, there's a real push within government for outsourcing and contestability. So whether that's done through a social benefit bond or just more sophisticated outsourcing contracts, it's part of the landscape within New South Wales and I think with more conservative states it's probably part of the landscape of Australia. It would be a mistake to think that a social benefit bond is a panacea, that you can just march in and say all social ills can be done. So I think there are some bond programs that just are not amenable to, or sorry, some social programs that are just not amenable to bonds. They're just, you know, all too difficult. Um, I think out of home care, it was great that we started off with Uniting Care uh, Burnside because they, there was an existing product. Uh, it's become a little, it became a little harder doing it with the um, a benevolent society because there was novelty to it, but it was done. When you're dealing with government, and I'm, I'm pitching this more to the NGOs, I think, in the room rather than the investors, because Craig and his colleagues, Social Ventures Australia, are great at understanding what the investors want and, and crafting and designing the bonds to meet what is in the marketplace. And we do listen, because it's no use as government doing all this work in setting up a bond program and then have it fall flat on its face with no one uh, taking up the bonds. So we started working on this uh, social benefit bond program at least a year before the O'Farrell government came in. It was actually an initiative of Christina Keneally. And, and very pleasingly, it transitioned from the Labor government to the Liberal government uh, seamlessly because people saw it was a worthwhile thing to do. And it's got support at a very, very high level, people like Peter Shergold and the like. But government moves very methodically and I think in a very linear manner. Uh, government wants to go from A to B to C to D. Government doesn't go from A to C or certainly doesn't go from A to D. So it has boxes that it has to tick. You know, How does it fit within tax? a tax treatment, bring in the Treasury people? How does it fit within what the Lion Agency wants to deliver? Bring in those people. How does it fit within the overall um, funding uh, limits for the state? What, it's, what are its implications for reputational matters, uh, for capital markets, for Sydney as a capital market centre of the world? You've got to tick all of those things off. And government also works a little strangely that in the private sector, where, whereas you might have <laughs> two concentrated weeks of meetings to just get it over and done with. Um, the public sector is much more, we've set aside Wednesdays to do these and you know, we've got three hours on Wednesday and you might be just at a critical point but it doesn't matter, Wednesday is over, we'll see you the following Wednesday. And that's how two years uh, evolved. So you, you can't judge it against what would be the normal time frame because two years of the same sandwiches is extremely troubling every Wednesday that you know you'll get the same sandwiches. No, the sandwiches were just for the government team. It's after you left the meeting. Um, so, um, I think it was a great it was a great program because it was described by the government as a pilot program, and that's really critical. The government was prepared to look at things and do things in a way that what it would not normally do. That doesn't mean it drops its requirements about probity, but conversations could take place. There was an understanding that these programs were going to deliver. Uh, outcomes that currently weren't being delivered by government. So that, that was a great initiative because it wasn't then saying, well, let's compare it to what government's already doing or how government's doing it. I think one of the great outcomes of this social benefit bond program is that the line agencies understand themselves a lot better. When, when we were doing the ones on uh, out of home care and we were talking to facts, and as Craig said, evidence and data is everything, and you'd say to facts, You've got 130 fields on this particular form that you've got to fill in uh, about a child who's in foster care, but we don't understand why you need 
you know, 40 of those 130 fields, no one had asked those questions before. So the reality is that the line agency becomes a lot smarter and a lot better at understanding what it's doing, why it's doing it, how to measure what it's doing. So there may be some programs which are not suitable for social benefit bonds, but they're still suitable for being outsourced or, or, or um, out, uh, contracted out by government. So just because a program is looked at as a social benefit bond and someone says it isn't going to work, which is possible because it may just not stack up financially, or there may not be a cohort uh, big enough or a co or a counterfactual suitable to do it, it is still potentially suitable. So you, you'll end up contracting with, smart, with government that is smarter and better at, better at understanding what it wants to do. Now, for NGOs, I think for government, you, th there are people who are not used to the process of documentation, the need almost to start with a blank sheet of paper and say, what are the headline terms and conditions that we're trying to agree upon? Why are we doing things? What are the, and it's a lawyer's role to try and tease that out, but you know, what happens if certain things come? And you've got to go through that process, and that is a time-consuming process, because the lawyers and other advisors in the room are directing people in the room to think about things that they had not otherwise thought about. Um, you know, what happens if, uh, I mean, I remember, Years ago, I don't want to confuse this with the with PPP, but I did the school's PPP, and you say, well, what happens if we have um, uh, cryptosporidium in the water? You know, what does that mean for a school? If you can't, if the kids can't drink water, uh, it doesn't, that is one possibility, <laughs> but you know, you've got to understand that. You know, things that people don't ordinarily think about. Um, a lot of the challenges in the nitty gritty, we created as part of the documentation for these bonds an operations manual to try to take it away from the drafting of the lawyers and to have just a day-to-day -day operations manual that was created by uh, uh, count, uh, um, counterparties from the NGO and from the investor and from the government on a day-to-day -day basis saying, how do we induct people into the cohort? What happens if somebody's in the cohort and they die? Somebody in the cohort and they move into state? All that nitty gritty stuff that actually has to be thought through and is not necessarily thought through just when someone says the headline, hey, let's do a social benefit bond on um, out of home care um, and the like. Um, I think the lessons that were learned, or some of the challenges, and they were touched upon by Craig, these are intense project management exercises. You know, you've got people from different perspectives standing behind an SVA, standing behind an investor. You've got the lawyers, you've got potential investors who have particular expectations. It seems like an awful lot of work because these are relatively small bond issues. You're talking five or ten million dollars at the moment. One hopes they'll be a lot, lot larger, but it's still the same amount of work. In fact, if anything, it's a disproportionately large amount of work for the bond uh, series that is involved. Um, we found some challenges in dealing with the not-for-profits. It will come as, you know, no surprise that, uh, I mean, not to you know, finger anyone, but if you read the constitution of something like the Uniting Church, you boy, you, you shake your head a little bit and, and um, you know, say, what, what is the actual entity that you are contracting with? It's not a criticism of the United Church, they've been doing this for years and years, but when you have to drill into it and say, which is the entity we're going to contract with? Which is the entity within the church? And it's not just the Uniting Church, a lot of these uh, slightly older organisations which haven't renewed or refreshed their constitutions, who are perhaps regulated by legislation that goes back 30, 40, 50 years. Salvation Army's legislation goes back to the uh, late 20s or the early 30s. They weren't designed for these sort of things. So there are some roadblocks along the way, but the government I think pleasingly, sees this, consistent with the comment I made about Gary Sturgis, as a really important way to move forward. And you've got two different perspectives of government. You've got um, people, ministers like Goward uh, from FACTS, who say this is really important, it supplements what my line agency does. And you've got ministers uh, like uh, Baird in Treasury who are saying this is really important about developing the capital markets, the depth of the capital markets and the, sta and the standing of Sydney or standing of Australia. And since we've done the, the Australian one, because you're probably all aware there was the Peterborough one done in the UK and the UK was first cab off the rank and then Australia or New South Wales announced that it was going to do it and we were proudly the second cab off the rank and then a little bit like a tortoise, people kept going past us in New York and elsewhere. But it is now, this is now seen as somewhat of a state of the art type social benefit bond. It proves that it can be done. There's enormous interest um, outside, well, in New South Wales, what comes after the pilot program, outside New South Wales um, and beyond. I think one of the big issues uh, for government is to make sure that there is 
a level playing field, that this shouldn't be a product that is only, you can only do it if you are of the size of Mission or Benevolent or Salvation Army or Uniting Care. Um, I've made that point to government. I think they understand it. It comes as no surprise to me that the pilots were done or are being done uh, by those larger organisations, the organisations that can sustain some of the costs involved in doing it. But one hopes that there will be a commoditisation of documentation, uh, that when we do the next one, instead of having to focus at great length on what termination payments will be, we can really jump into the nitty gritty, or indeed, the nitty gritty can be done before the, before the lawyers even get into the room. So we're only you know, focusing on a few important bits and pieces, and the lawyers are not trying to poke their noses uh, into the day-to-day -day, um, operation. Um, when you're contracting with government, you know, you've just got to be patient. Of course, there are going to be detailed clauses on freedom of information and intellectual property, and you're going to wonder, not to be repeated, why you need a three-page clause on intellectual property on a deal like this, but that's just why you need a four-page clause on archives, but it's just part of dealing with government. And you have to show the patients to get over those issues because they're not the main game. So, you know, in summary, I think government's learned an enormous amount from this. There is great enthusiasm about this. There's a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks' time where all the heads of Treasury from around Australia are getting together. Uh, at the invitation of, New South, of the New South Wales government to talk about social benefit bonds. New South Wales is very keen uh, to share its learning on these things. And I think you just need to stand ready. But, but as, as, as NGOs, you've got to be very careful what it is that you are trying to deliver. What is the service that you're trying to deliver? How does it tie in with what a department is currently doing? What involvement do you need from the department? What you, know, you need to ask all those sorts of questions. So I think if the NGOs do those sorts of preparations, you can look at the documents, not currently at the moment, but all of these, uh, all of the contracts that were signed will, will eventually, and I mean by that within probably the next two or three months, go up on the Treasury website as redacted documents. So you won't be able to see the financial terms of you know, Westpac and SVA, but you'll be able to see the suite of documents, what the standard commercial terms and conditions were. You, you can really prepare yourself for what is the next round. And you only need to come away from last night's dinner and for these last two days to say this is just such a, an exciting uh, topic. It's got such breadth and depth. You can, it's so flexible. You can mould so many solutions around these sorts of products that um, it's an exciting time. Thanks very much. So we've got about five minutes for questions and then we'll finish with the round.